Um, so okay. the, the I'm going to go ahead and ooh, go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to, to officially kick this off while we yeah. wait for Alicia to then. So um, I just want to call to order the school board finance committee meeting uh, for April 28th. Uh, so we really just have one main agenda item tonight, which is um, just a review of the FY21 budget that, um, suggestions that you guys have made, um, given the, the latest sort of directive that we had from town council in um, looking for areas of reduction. Um, so I think we can, we can start off there and then also discuss um, just some preparation for the joint finance committee meeting tomorrow night get to any questions, Kate, if we have time that you've received. And then I wanna leave, make sure we leave some ample time for public comment as well. Everyone comfortable with that agenda? Sounds good. Okay, and I guess just a couple of notes that I wanna make at the top. Um, we did get a request from a few people about the materials for this meeting. Um, thank you for your patience. Every The team was working on them literally right up until the minute before this meeting. So they were just posted now and they are available if you want to follow along. Um, Kelly, I think they're posted on our Finance Committee agenda page um, under supporting materials. That's wrong. Kelly can correct me. There no, they're there. Okay, awesome. Um, and I did also just want to take a minute just to thank everyone who's been working so hard on the endless amount of hours that I know the three of you, as well as the leadership council, the rest of the leadership council has put into coming up with um, all of these options. This is really challenging work. Um, these are gonna be really difficult discussions. We're not talking about pencils and papers. We're talking about people and programs and services and these things are important. Um, and so I would just, wanted to say thank you and offer that gratitude, but also say thank you to the public who has been patient with us during this time. There's a lot of people who are asking questions. Um, and to Kate's point, we have had some other priorities, so we haven't had the chance to get to those questions, but we will get to them. Um, and so just wanna you know, make that acknowledgement, thank everyone for following along and being patient with us. Um, and just know that this is gonna be a process and a difficult one. So. Hopefully everyone's just doing the best that they can to cope. So with that, um, Kate, I will hand it over to you. All right, so I had two quick, uh, pretty quick items that I wanted to talk about uh, before we dive into the potential reductions document. That's, that's really the only thing that's posted. I don't have backup materials for any of my other comments, but um, there have been two big topics that came up in the last two weeks. One is, what about the CARES Act money? What about stimulus money coming from the state uh, or from the feds through the state? Um, how does that help Scarborough? What is that likely to look like? And um, I'll ask Diane to chime in because she um, listened to a, a good webinar about this recently, but I've, the, the information that I have is pretty basic right now. What they've told us from the Department of Education, and this is our, our state Department of Ed, that's advising us. They've said that the money is going to come down through the state in the same way that our title grants come and our um, local entitlement special education monies come. They'll come from the feds to the state and then be distributed to local communities. The formula that they've been told to use to distribute the funds, um, so they have a, an aggregate amount that's going to come to the state, and the formula they've been told to use to distribute the funds is the formula they use to distribute Title I funds. So for example, um, the town manager the other day said, oh gosh, I heard Lowston's gonna get $2 million. Wouldn't it be really great if Scarborough got $2 million? Um, Lewiston is maybe gonna get $2 million because Lewiston gets over $2 million in Title I funds. Scarborough only gets about 130 thousand dollars in Title I funds. So uh, the proportion we've been given is 83% of last year's Title I monies. I'm not sure what they mean by last year, if they mean FY19, FY20, or even FY18. Um, but um, I'm looking forward to something between 120 and $150,000, which is not 
anything that I'm going to give back. I'm really excited about having that money because it will help support some of the unusual things that we have to address because of the pandemic and because school's been closed for so long. Um, but it's not gonna be a huge windfall to support our budget. So I, I just wanted to, to get that out there, um, you know, not to be a Debbie Downer, but just, you know, the people understand the, the likelihood of, of support that Scarborough is gonna receive. Um, so I don't know if you all have been hearing any questions about that, if there's anything else that you wanted me to clarify. No? Not at that point specifically, but Kate, um, you did also, you're, you are also planning to cover sort of some of the savings that we'll see from COVID-19 and not being in school and things like that, right? Right. So that's, that's the second thing that I wanted to tackle before we head into the reductions question, because um, the second really huge question that's come up is, well, are we going to save enough money in FY20 with having school closed for there to be a significant impact and for us to be able to use some of that money um, to help us in FY21? So the short answer to that question is yes. Um, somewhere in the middle of all of my crazy last few days, I finished my budget to actual analysis, um, new and improved COVID-19 version um, for FY20 for um, this year that we're in right now. And um, I didn't create a document for this. I have some notes. Um, I'm just gonna hit some high points for you. And then you know I'll, I'll try to put something on paper that we can share or in a you know, Google doc that we can share. Um, but just um, again, the bottom line being that I did find some extra funds as you might expect. Um, and that's gonna be part of this presentation that um, the reductions that we're hoping to make to our original budget request. Um, just to give you the highlights um, for personnel, I think everybody knows that all of our regular staff are still receiving their pay and their benefits. Um, however, we've got um, what I would call normal turnover savings, which is the type of savings that we typically see from one budget year to the next when we have people resigning and moving on and changing benefits and so forth. Um, I think it's a little bit higher than it is some years. Um, I'm looking at around $500,000 and I'm, I am assuming in those calculations that the, um, the teacher bargaining unit will receive their retro pay. Um, but I think with the, you know, the, the comings and goings of, of staff, we've got a little bit nicer amount there than we sometimes do. Substitutes is another area. Um, we don't need to employ daily substitutes because we're not in school. Um, so we're not covering positions in the same way that we would. We do have a few long-term subs working and they're actually acting in the place of the teacher that, that is out on leave. So we have a, a handful of those, but I'm anticipating saving somewhere around $120,000 on subs through the rest of the year. Um, and we also have some unfilled positions that went unfilled. Um, special education ed techs during the year had a good bit of turnover, which isn't unusual. They waited to fill some positions while kids were coming and going. They've had kids in and out of district. Um, and we had a position in central office that wasn't filled until halfway through the year. So I'm looking at maybe another 250, 270,000 uh, there. Um, apart from personnel, other significant savings. Um, people have asked quite a bit about spring sports and activities being canceled. Definitely gonna save some money on contracted transportation. And I think overall uh, between athletics and some of the general driving that they've been doing for us with um, Custom Coach, we're gonna save about $65,000 there. Probably save something on the order of $50,000 for spring sports. Um, and it kind of, that kind of depends on where we land in terms of what our expectations are of our coaches and whether we're gonna be paying partial stipends. And you know, that's been an ongoing conversation. Facilities, repairs and maintenance. Um, in some senses, Todd is, has been making use of the fact that the buildings are empty to actually get some work done. Um, but he also isn't encouraging contractors to come into the buildings and be working you know, together in closed spaces. 
So I'm assuming that we're probably going to pull another $250,000 or so from that area. Um, instructional supplies, printing, professional development, all of the discretionary accounts, we are, had already asked our school leaders to try to curtail those. Um, Mid-year, we had sort of a soft curtailment saying, okay, we really need to maximize fund balance. And I don't have a, a, a dollar number on that because it's incremental through the entire budget, um, but it definitely feeds into the bottom line. Um, special education tuition, uh, got a little fluidity there because the Department of Ed has said in much the same way they've said, pay your employees, they've also said, pay your contracted services. Um, speaking of the out of district um, special purpose private schools, they don't want those folks to fold because those are critical services and they're still providing supports to their students. Um, they're providing distance learning in, in much the same way that we are. Um, so I'm thinking we may save $100,000 there. That's a little bit more fluid number. Utilities and fuel, I'm anticipating about $150,000 savings. Um, utilities, because we don't have all the lights on, we have, um, you know, the heat turned down a little bit and um, we're not running a lot of equipment. There's still a lot of equipment that needs to run, um, electrical equipment, but not all of it all the time. Uh, and I don't know if y'all have noticed uh, at the gas pumps, our, our fuel prices have tanked, which is really nice right about the time no one can go anywhere. You gotta love market forces, right? You don't need gas, but you could afford it now. Um, but we have buses off the road, so we'll have fuel savings um, and maintenance vehicles off the road, so we'll have fuel savings there as well. Um, so those are the big items of significant savings, and I know I think all of you have seen me do like a year-end presentation where I kind of bullet out the big chunks of things that lead to year-end fund balance. Um, the big differences, I think, apart from some of the unanticipated shifts that we've made to facilitate distance learning, um, things like signing up for Zoom and getting different licenses for different online softwares, um, none of that so far has proved to be hugely expensive. Um, but I have my, my eye on that as we get all the way through to the end of the school year, what that might look like. Um, we were in a, in a nice position that, in that we had devices on hand so that we could deploy those to kids without spending new money. Um, but that's a, that's a little area of wonder. Um, and then there's some pieces that are really just part of our regular budget where you have some shortages and you have some surpluses. So. We have um, our debt service lines are gonna be $46,000 over budget. And that's because we got um, an, a low budget estimate when we built the budget for FY20 and the numbers came in higher. Um, that would be the case whether we had a closure or not. Um, same thing for legal costs, that's gonna be about $32,000 over budget. Um, a COVID-19 related expense is going to be unemployment because our subs who we're not paying can go out and file for unemployment. Um, coaches can go out and file for unemployment. Anybody who's not gonna be receiving a paycheck uh, is entitled to file for unemployment. And um, the Scarborough schools are what you call a direct reimbursement employer where we don't purchase unemployment insurance through the Department of Labor. What we do is we pay directly if somebody has a benefit. So if I lose my job and I file for unemployment and I show up on a monthly bill for unemployment, that bill gets paid by Scarborough directly. So what I've done there is I figured out through the end of the year, meaning June 30 of 2020, we're probably gonna be on the hook for about $30,000 over our budget, um, which isn't really a huge amount. Um, it's, uh, it could be, it could be worse, but it's a short period of time. But obviously these folks, you know, some of them have worked with us every day for the last three years. Some of them have worked for us once in a while, you know, a, a day here or a day there. So for some of them, we might have um, a, a liability, if you call it, or a responsibility to pay a hundred bucks. But for some of them, we might have a responsibility to pay $3,000. And um, it, it's all uh, 
it's all laid out for us by Department of Labor. We get a notice that says, you know, here's your person who's filed. Here's how much your um, cost is likely to be. Um, so those are, are real numbers at the moment. Um, and then the other places where I'm looking at shortfalls, so reductions in our fund balance, I'm looking at about a $250,000 revenue shortfall in general fund. Um, a piece of that is going to be the regular reduction that the Department of Education takes for main care seed. And we've talked about that in the past and I, I won't go too deep into that, but um, that's a piece of it. And then also uh, we won't have the opportunity to do rentals. Um, we've given back some spring athletic fees and won't be collecting any more of those. Um, facility rentals, as I said, are, are not gonna be happening this spring when we often have those. Um, so all told, I'm looking at a shortfall there. Um, I would probably have had a shortfall anyway, um, but it's a little bit more significant with the closure. Um, then two big pieces uh, are gonna be the two other funds that we're responsible for. One is school nutrition and the other is adult ed. And both of those are revenue generating um, and usually fairly revenue neutral. I guess we all know um, how school nutrition typically fares, but adult ed typically ends the year uh, without us having to pay attention to it. Their, their fund balance is, is pretty flat because they charge tuition and then they have expenses and the expenses are covered by the tuition. Um, so what we've got right now is we have the director's salary and the assistant in adult education who are being paid because they are still there and they are still doing some level of work. Some of the workforce programs are still going as an online program. Some folks who were in the middle of licensing, um, you know, trying to get their CNA or trying to get their med tech or, or whatever, we're not um, bailing on those folks. We're, we're trying to get them through so that they can take their test and, and get out into the workforce. So there's this sort of um, uh, combination of distance learning and just trying to sort of finish up programming for folks. So the bottom line there is that I'm thinking we're going to have about a $20,000 shortfall there, um, which we'll have to cover in some way. And I'm, I'm assuming that we'll do that from general fund. School nutrition is a little bit bigger problem because as we know, at the end of the year, school nutrition often needs a little help from the general fund. And right now, again, we're paying all of our staff their regular hours. We're not taking in any revenue. Um, we're, we're getting lots of really kind and, and generous donations for the backpack program. Um, we, are, we have signed up for uh, what they're calling a, a summer offsite program. It's not summer, obviously, but the Department of Ed and the USDA are trying to flex a bit in these circumstances and be able to feed families uh, with free and reduced lunch status um, still deliver meals offsite and there's a lot of re relaxation to that program. So we should probably still get some revenues from the state, but it's not gonna be like it would be if we were open. Um, you know, obviously serving, you know, 50, 60, even 100 families is very different from serving 3000 kids and having that potential for, um, for earnings. So I'm looking at about a $650,000 um, chunk there, which obviously takes a big piece out of what we've saved um, in general fund. So I'm, I'm throwing out a lot of numbers here. And like I said, I'll try to put this out on paper so people can see it. I just didn't have time to create something that's actually understandable. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm thinking that when we get to the end of all of this, we'll have a balance of $800,000 more than what I expected. When we put this budget on the table um, last month, actually it hasn't even been a month, holy cow. Uh, when we put this budget on the table in, uh, for first reading, we had $300,000 of fund balance used as non-tax revenue. And so what I'm gonna propose is to add another 400,000 for this year uh, for FY21 as non-tax revenue, which would then, you know, that would increase it to a total of 700,000. And what I'm hoping is that that'll leave about 400,000 in the pot for FY22. 
Um, you know, I'm a very conservative person. It could be more than that. And I would be delighted if we had more than that. Um, and we'll obviously, we hope we'll generate a little bit of fund balance in FY21 as well. But the closer we go to the bone in FY21, the more likely we are to not have a huge amount of fund balance at the end of that year. All right, so that was a lot of, a lot of sentences. Um, but that's pretty much what I'm seeing, and that's what I'm going to have as, as, as a piece of this proposal for reductions. Do I have questions? My question is more of an ask if it's possible. I know you said you would put that into a document, but if it's possible to do that in advance of like for tomorrow for the joint finance meeting, meeting tomorrow, I think some of those questions specifically came from the town counselors. I can do my best. I know I've got a couple of things that I've, I've kind of bailed on that I, I've got to get done tomorrow, but um, I will see whether I can't at least get a rough document. If I put a lot of colors in it, it'll look good, right? Don't worry about making it pretty. Sorry, Alicia, I see your hands up. Speak freely, guys. Thanks. Um, I just want to clarify um, I think I understand, but I re really want to clarify for those people listening because it's a question that I get asked commonly, Kate. Um, if I understand the executive orders, number one, the governor has said that the state has to continue paying all hourly employees. Is that correct? That's true. Yeah. Uh, all hourly school employees. Right. right? Excuse me. Yeah. So um, so there is a difference, and we've had that come up in conversations with the town, where the, the um, town is actually furloughing people. Um, they have different obligations, but our, um, our uh, rule has come from the governor through the Department of Education, and they've, they've tried to sort of make sure that we understand what it all means. Um, so we have asked quite a few questions about it, wondering, you know, well, is this person does it count this person or not? Um, but really what we're looking at is everybody who has a regularly scheduled job with the school department. So bus drivers, school nutrition, custodians, all the support staff, um, education building, secretaries, and all the um, instructional personnel are all considered essential workers. They're supposed to work. Um, and if they, if we don't have work for them in any given moment, they're considered to be on call. And um, so they are still receiving their pay and benefits. So if, for example, I'm a school lunch worker and I typically work a 30 hour week, that's what I'm getting paid for. Okay, thank you. And then the other um, fixed cost that, and well, before I move on to that, our employees are broken down primarily to um, hourly employees or salaried employees. Is that also correct? Yes. Uh, I think the only exception would be uh, a per diem worker, like a, a substitute and, the, or, and or a coaching stipend. Yeah. But everybody is either hourly or salary. That's a regular worker. And so we're contractually required to pay um, the salaried employees. Yes. So at this point, there's no wiggle room in terms of what's going on with the pandemic in terms of what we're paying our employees. There really isn't, you know, and, and I know that Diane has reached out for some more specific guidance a couple of times just to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And um, yeah, it's a pretty clear directive. It's like everybody who works for you, everybody who is working for you on a regularly scheduled um, time frame when you closed your doors is still working for you and you still pay them and you still have benefits for them. Is there, because the town has um, furloughed some of their employees, is there a way that we could take some of our hourly employees that we're not utilizing to their full potential and maybe use them for cross purposes on the town side where they're um, furloughing people and potentially giving them an opportunity to furlough more to qualify for unemployment where where we don't have that opportunity? I'm not sure I know exactly what you're saying, but I think what you're saying is, let's say if I laid off someone from public works, could someone who's a custodian go and do that job because we have to pay the custodian anyway, that yeah. kind of thing? Yeah. 
Um, well, it's not something that we've addressed with the town. I'm not sure what kind of duties might be going unfilled. I don't know either. I was just wondering if if that was a conversation that has occurred and, and if you know of any reason why that couldn't happen. I don't off the top of my head. Um, I, I wonder, um, I know that the one thing that sort of pops into my head in, in that context is the um, the Department of Ed has said um, that the work that we give to folks shouldn't necessarily be like make work. Like, you know, we're gonna have you school lunch person go in and, you know, paint the baseboards because we want you to earn your money, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that if there was important work that needed to be done, um, I don't I don't know how that kind of a crossover would work. I think that, you know, would certainly be something we'd have to get some guidance on. Okay. I was just curious and thank you for your explanation. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. And and it's and there is a kind of a big I don't know there. I don't I don't know whether there would be some tasks on the town side that we could help with. Um, and if so, you know, then we could certainly look into seeing whether that was something that that we could do. Um, Certainly right now, I think people are staying kind of within their lane a little bit. You know, the teachers are teaching, the ed techs are supporting the teachers and the and the, um, the building organizations. The bus drivers are driving buses. Um, the food service folks are feeding the community. So, I mean, everybody's pretty much staying in their lane. The custodians are cleaning whenever anybody's going in a building and using it. So um, that's that's some interesting thinking to, to think about shifting that a little bit. Okay, thank you. Hey, just before we move on, I just want to um, acknowledge, as I said at the top of the meeting, we're going to take public comment at the end of the meeting. Um, so I know there's a couple people that have their hands up. Um, so just ask if we will let you know that we acknowledge it um, and that we'll get to it at the end of the meeting. If you can't stick around, you have to leave. You can also just email the board and we'll get back to you with a written response. So would they just use the, the BOE um, at Scarborough Schools, is that the best way for them to get to us? I think you can do that one, or there's one I'm just reading my email. It's public comment mm -hmm. at scarboroughschools.org. So public comment at scarboroughschools.org. You can email that, um, or obviously, if you just email the BOE, it will get that as well. Go ahead, April. And I would say that one would be used if you would like something specifically read out loud at our meeting. So if it's a general question that you would just like us to get back to you, then you can email us at BOE at Scarborough Schools. But if it's something that you specifically want read into the public record, then please use that other public comment at scarboroughschools.org email address. Thanks for that clarification. All right. So, All right. Um, I've got my document teed up here and Sandy, my thought was just to kind of go through the tiers and talk a little bit about the process, but do you want to start us off with a conversation about the kind of work we've been doing and, you know, how, how we've been tackling this problem? Absolutely. Um, so we've been really working hard as a team, uh, trying to take the directive of what we think would be a reduction amount of money and to try to go line by line throughout the budget. Um, of all honesty, it really is gonna impact staff. 80% of our budget is labor intensive. So that's where the money is at. And we've worked as an administrative team um, to look at different levels of reductions. So for instance, level one, tier one, if you, whichever you wanna call that, um, would be probably our top priority reductions. And as you move down the ladder, tier two or three, it becomes increasingly more challenging to live with those reductions. And that's really been our work in the last week. Um, we are sensitive to the fact that we're in a different time right now than we were six weeks ago. I think at one point we were looking at a 3% increase 
which was worked out with the council. We don't wanna be blind and not understand what the community and the state is going through. We understand there will be a loss of revenues on the town side and at the state side. And so we're trying to be mindful of the indicators that are coming our way and to be responsible. And at the same time, we wanna make sure that the learning can continue in a great way as it always has in Scarborough. So that is sort of the big picture framework that we've been working on in the last week, week and a half. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think um, we've kind of bounced back and forth between the full leadership council and then the central office, office leadership team, um, tried to you know, frame things out and, and take chunks and think about what the impacts might be. And we did land with a, um, a, a format that comes out in sections. Um, and as Sandy said, we sort of started with the um, the items that would create the least harm and the, the smallest impact and worked our way down to more painful and um, impactful decisions that might need to be made. Um, Diane, did you wanna add anything or should we dive in here? I think we should probably dive in. Um, you know, I think this has been very hard work and there's nothing, um, you know, that, that we've been examining that really isn't integral to our organization. I think the only other thing that I would add is I think that there has been really thoughtful work on the part of the entire team in looking across our whole organization to say um, where within each of the cost centers is there an opportunity for savings uh, so that we are not looking at any one sector to absorb um, the, any cuts that have to be made um, across the board. Right, right. And and being, you know, really data driven and kind of process driven and, and trying to figure out where we can um, piece away without creating too much. Well, I'm not going to say that we're creating lots of drama. So the first page here is um, the budget so far. And what you've got here in the yellow, I think you can see my little fingers here. So I'll wave them around. Um, the yellow is last year's budget, or this year, sorry, at point 20, the year we're currently in. And in each block, block you've got the gross expenditures, you've got the non-tax revenues, and then you've got what we're asking for in local taxes. Um, and this is kind of stolen from or borrowed from the document that we use for the investment proposals, because it seemed to be really helpful for folks to be able to see those impacts um, kind of as you move through the decisions that you're making and the choices that you're making. So I kind of stole that um, and, and used it in this context as well. Um, the bright green block is reduced level services, which means we figure out our level services budget and we take out what we think might be turnover savings for retirees. And we had one um, half of a position that we had already reduced up front um, built into that. So that was kind of uh, the bright green is kind of as low as you go and maintain what you call what we call level services, which means we've looked at every line, we've reallocated funds as needed, but we're carrying on with the same programs with no new monies added. And then the blue block is the total with investments added, with new investments added. Um, and so the blue block is what was approved by the school board at first reading on April 9th and what was presented on the 8th by Sandy and Tom as part of the overall municipal budget. So those are the numbers that are on the table right now. So the first page we have tier one reduction targets. <clears throat> and I'm gonna say up front that um, we're being um, high level here. We're not talking about uh, as much as we can, we're not talking about specific people whose names are gonna be on a marquee and their jobs are gonna be cut because first of all, why would we do that? That's really painful and we're not there yet. Um, and secondly, um, there are some items in motion here. We don't know for certain which people may eventually not be renewed 
um, or have a reassignment in their position. So we've put a general statement out to our staff to say we're, we've got some major reductions to be made. And you know that these are the areas that we're considering, that we're looking at, and that we're we're going to be having a lot more conversations with the town and uh, and with our own school board about where those reductions are going to come from. So that's my generic hey, intro. Hey, Terry, can I just pause you for one second, just because I I know this question will come up. If you go back up to the original slide, yep, or the first slide rather, can you just um verify the the percentage change on the side that's in oh it says it right there okay so gender fund so 3.4 so it's 2.77 percent that's not the mill rate that's in our portion of the tax request exactly exactly okay, cool. so the um the the numbers that are out there if you look at the overall municipal budget this is just a piece of it You've got general fund education, then you've got adult ed, you've got school nutrition, and you've got capital, which folds school and town together. Um, so where we've focused most of our energy is on the general fund, because that's where most of our money is. Um, but we do have um, a one revenue change, which is the fund balance that I talked about, and we have some capital project changes as well. But you're right, that's not the tax rate increase. That's our increase in our request for taxes from the town. Great, thank you. Um, and that'll be true as we go through this. It's the, the bottom line, the school portion of the tax request is what we're looking at. Um, so in tier one, we started by adjusting items in motion. And we know we have items in motion between first and second reading every year. Um, what that means is we got better numbers for things or we've made changes. Um, our dental insurance company was nice enough to tell us that instead of giving us the new rates that they gave us a few weeks ago, they're going to have a rate hold instead. They reached out to all our customers and said, we're not going to raise our rates um, to help you guys out. So um, that was cool. And um, the other one where I say staff estimate updates, that's based on some open contracts that we have some new information through negotiations about um, made a little adjustment there the next chunk is actually kind of counterintuitive it says we're going to add funding um, and the reason that we're going to add funding in this section is in response to uh, the pandemic um, and the guidance that we've been receiving from the department of ed and from you know the governor's office so the items that are in here are actually going to increase the budget before we decrease it um, the first item is two nursing positions, and I, I might let Diane speak to that one because she's been having those conversations. Yeah, so as we consider the reopening of schools and what that may look like for us in the fall, um, and the reality that uh, there will still be effects from COVID-19 and, and potential new cases will continue to crop up. Uh, the DOE is offering some very strong guidance to schools at this time in regards to making sure that there is uh, sufficient medical coverage in place in each of our schools. Um, in addition, if you, um, oh, I don't think it's in here. One of the other things that we've been talking about is also in regards to what some of that those space needs will be um, for our nurses in in our buildings. Because again, uh, as we think about needing to develop safety protocols in the case that uh, there might be a concern that someone on site is uh, demonstrating symptoms. Uh, we really are going to have to develop a new set of protocols and precautions. We had started down this road and had been talking in this direction just prior to the close of schools um, in March, actually, with the nurses. And so um, these things are coming back uh, to the plate again, and it really would behoove us to plan ahead for this right now and to make sure that we have our students and staff safety um, first and foremost in our minds. So yeah, we do have some, we had some conversation about space and how the clinics are. In the K-2 schools, the first thing to know is that there's one RN registered nurse and one 
medical assistant who cover those three schools. So the recommendation is that you have uh, a nurse at each location. Um, so that's what that's why there's two FTEs in there, and we would redeploy the medical assistant to help out in one of the other buildings. Um, and then the, the next two pieces are, um, one is about student supports, and we, we're spending a ton of time talking in leadership team about what is it gonna look like when kids come back to school? Are we gonna have a summer program? Is the summer program going to be um, you know, designed to catch kids up? Is it going to be social emotional learning because everybody's been through this traumatic experience? So a ton of those conversations are going on in between special education where you have mandates for comp education or um, com compensation or what is it called compensatory? I've got the wrong, uh, <laughs> wrong lingo. Uh, students who have missed out or have fallen behind need to be able to recover. And then you have gen ed where students are gonna be falling behind simply because of the nature of this beast that we're in. Um, so that's a place where we wanted to add some funding. And then the targeted K-12 professional development is actually an add and a reduction. You'll see the reductions later on. Um, so it's a wash, but we wanted to put it up here because we really think that we're gonna have to be working um, with staff uh, on some very specific ways to support their students and to reintroduce their students back into a school environment. And also to support a, uh, ongoing distance learning if we need to tackle that. Um, and we really just don't know what that might look like if we're, um, if we're gonna be facing this situation again. So you have this little segment here, which is let's put some money in before we take money out. Um, then the first thing that we did after that was to talk to the leadership council about reductions to what we call discretionary accounts, which are things like books, contracted services, general supplies, instructional supplies, um, workbooks, pencils, all of those good things. Um, and the $184,000 is made up of a bunch of little tiny line items where each school leader has gone back through their department and said, I can do without this, I can shrink this, I can make, make this smaller. Um, it's the type of reduction that we would ask folks to do in a curtailment where we're not laying people off, but we're trying to conserve funds. Um, so that was kind of the approach that we took with that. Um, this next item, the $348,000 is in capital budget. And um, we have, a, we put a capital budget out and we approve the capital budget on the school side and then it gets folded into the town's capital budget and the town finance office those are the folks who decide how capital projects are funded um, so i know that some capital projects are funded through tax dollars and some are bonded and i reached out to ruth uh, porter the finance director and said can you show me your chart of where you have determined our capital projects will be funded from. I think that was a tortured sentence too. From where, up with which, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, no silly grammar. Um, in any case, Ruth shared that with me and I shared that with Todd and said, okay, of these capital projects that impact the bottom line on tax dollars, on the tax rate, because they're appropriated monies, what can we reduce? And so this reduction is made up of um, Don giving up a couple of things on the IT budget, um, facilities, scaling back in some cases, and postponing in some cases, and um, eliminating in some cases the projects that they put out there. Um, and in transportation, we had one project where we were going to try to replace wholesale cameras on 15 buses, the camera systems. So there's like four cameras, I think, in a, in a hard drive in each bus. Um, and we decided we would take that out as a big project and, you know, maybe try to piece at it through operating budget if we can, um, but at the very least defer it. So the $348,000 isn't part of the general fund, but it does create a reduction to our tax ask. Um, in the same way, the $400,000, which I've made reference to 
in fund balance, it's going to go in as an additional revenue. So down here in this fancy box, you see apply additional fund balance as non-tax revenue. So it becomes the part a part of the offsetting revenues and again reduces our tax ask. The $400,000 will go into general fund. Um, the capital piece I've left a little bit separately out here because it's not part of general fund. But when you get to the bottom of um, tier one, you have an impact of a reduction of $658,000 to the tax request from the town, from the school to the town. This column is FTEs, and as we go down, you'll see I'm actually adding to there, but in tier two, we'll be taking them away. Um, questions about that first chunk? Maybe we should stop and at the end of, of each section. We've got four tiers that we're going to go through. Okay. <clears throat> Tier two reduction targets. And Sandy and Diane, jump in if I'm if I'm getting it wrong here, because I'm starting to get over my head. Uh, Again, a second set of leadership council reductions to discretionary accounts. So this is a little bit of a deeper dive where we're really eliminating some stuff. Facilities cut back on some of their projects um, that are built into the operating budget. Um, there's some uh, more staff development and uh, just a little bit deeper dive into the discretionary accounts there. Here's where we start affecting positions and people. Uh, we have three current staff positions that we're proposing to eliminate. Um, these folks are district employees, um, one in IT and two at central office. Uh, and those positions we're proposing to eliminate. We're also proposing to eliminate three positions for bus drivers that are not currently filled. They're open positions. We had budgeted for them because we were hoping to be able to field a full complement of bus drivers, um, the number of drivers that we would really prefer to have. Uh, but when we talked with Sarah about this, she said, you know, I can't ever find enough drivers to drive anyway, and um, I, I'll probably not have much luck filling those positions. Uh, so I'd like you to just take them away. It does leave one open position that we haven't, um, that isn't currently filled, but that um, we have the funding for. Reducing lead teacher positions. Um, this is uh, making uh, high school, sorry, not high school, 512. So it's, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm talking about here. Lead teacher stipends. Is so we're really looking at the structure of lead teachers um, at the middle school and then also um, the time for department heads versus their stipend at the high school. Right, thank you, Diane. And, and the, the reason that it's a big number is not that there's so many people getting huge stipends, but um, there's a half a position in there as well because one of our new, <clears throat> new position and in, new investments was to take half of an unfilled position of a retirement and redeploy that at Wentworth School into several stipends and an after school management stipend as well. Um, so it's a it's the Wentworth School giving up that that new investment that really bumps that number up. And then we get into programs and in tier two, we're trying to stay away from instruction. Right, so we're, we're looking at central office and support personnel, and we're looking at after school programs. We're not looking at core instruction or um, services during the school day. Um, this says eliminate after school programs based on lowest participation, high school and middle school, and eliminate Wentworth school clubs. So after school clubs would be gone at Wentworth and they would be uh, reductions in high school and middle school clubs and sports based on the lowest participation, um, you know, the least number of students impacted. 
So this section gives us a reduction of six and a half positions. Um, and I have a little summary at the bottom that says how many of them are unfilled and how many of them are current employees and how many might be transferred but still have a job. So we'll see that at the end. And this section gets us to uh, just over $1.2 million reduction. And you can see that I've got you a running total here of how our tax ask is changing. Um, and this is the general fund is down to a 3.3% increase over last year instead of if we go up to the beginning, it was 5.2, 5.24. Questions about this section? I do. Um, the, the clubs and, um, okay, it's after school programs, the lowest participation numbers at the high school and middle school, and then all Wentworth school clubs. Is that right? That's right. And what, I must have missed the high school and middle school sports reduction. Um, again, programs based on the lowest participation. So there will be some cuts to high school and middle school port, sports as well. Is that right? There will, there okay. will. And as what? we've looked at all of that, Alicia, what we've looked at was not just the lowest participation, but how do we also approach this from a uh, a point of equity or diversity and making sure that we still have a, di a diverse representation of programs so that we're not necessarily boxing out, you know, any one segment of our student population and, and saying, you know, that there's not going to be opportunities available for those students. So when you're looking at, at these reductions, those are also, minimal revenue generators, right? And that money goes into the general fund? Right, and so um, if they're the lowest participation, then you might reduce your cost and then you wouldn't have the fees for that. But you're right, you would be minimizing the amount of fees that you'd be losing as well. There's definitely an offset there. Is that considered in that number? Yeah, it's factored in. It is, okay, thank you. And obviously some of that is guessing because we don't know exactly how many kids are gonna participate in any given season, but we do have numbers from prior years that we can use um, for those estimates. Hey, Kate, just a question on the math here. Is, um, is this just tier two or is this a combination of tier one and tier two, the numbers combination of, This is a running total. Running total, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So each each time you get into the block, it's going to be adding the prior block. I mean, in in order to have you, did you discuss the administrative costs to run those programs versus the programming cuts? Whether there were administrative costs that could be made made. Uh, well, we have an administrative cut in this section. Um, but I think that if you're reducing two out of 30 or however many programs we have, and they're the smallest participation, I'm not sure how much of an impact we could have with that. Um, we did talk about- um, What do you mean, what can you, before you move on, what do you mean by that? I don't understand. Um, if you're cutting a portion of, of athletics or, or clubs, but you're leaving a portion, there's still an administrative um, piece that has to happen. We did talk about if, um, an entire program gets reduced or disappears, then what happens? Like if we said, well, we're just not gonna have middle school sports, what does that look like? Do we need somebody to help us run middle school sports? Um, so these are you know, some of the, the questions that we tossed around. Um, is that what you're, what you're thinking? I just wonder about some of the redundancies in the administrative costs, if, that, if you had looked at that versus the programming cuts. I'm not sure how to answer that one. I think that we really have, and I, you know, I don't know, to Kate's point, 
as we look at the overall structure, we've tried to really maintain the proportionate amount of sports and activities for students. And so, um, you know, certainly if we were cutting half of our sports and activities, there, there would be a reflection of half of those administrative costs. But as you can see up to this point, the, that level of cut, you know, we're, we're trying to, again, not shoulder this whole budget process on any one department. And so, you know, we've tried to be conservative in, in the cut that we've made to date. I just hate seeing the the programming cuts in level in tier two um, because we've seen how difficult it is to um, put it back, yeah. and um, I I just question. I'd I'd like to have maybe today is not the appropriate time, but I'd like to have a further discussion about um, some of the efficiencies that we might be able to make otherwise without a programming cut. Right. Here too. I would just remind you to keep in mind this is our first pass at this. Yeah. Right. So so we're beginning a conversation today. Okay. Um, you know, this certainly isn't the close of that conversation. Absolutely. And you know, we've we've been uh when you were wondering whether we'd we'd sort of thought about different things and asked about different things. We've we've been doing nothing but throwing things at the wall and and looking around them and and rejecting them and agreeing to them and then going back and rejecting them again. So um, it, Diane's right, it's it's definitely going to be a process. And this is the first time that you folks are having a chance to see this. So we haven't even had your input yet. Um, you know, that's that's got to be something that we work through as well. Um, so in tier three, things get a little dicier. Uh, we get into more of the, uh, the clubs at middle school and high school. And again, as Diane said, we're trying to maintain at least a representation of activities for kids to do at both levels. Um, we've put some focus uh, in our thoughts on clubs that support um, uh, classroom activities or academic activities. So for example, this proposal maintains robotics at high school and middle school. Um, it maintains things like academic decathlon. Um, and, um, you know, until we get deeper into this, if we have to go deep, then, you know, we're going to try to preserve those things as well as the service clubs like Heath Club and, um, you know, the, the stipends for the student government and things like that. Um, so again, sort of trying to chip away at things and leave things. Um, unified sports and clubs are in here. Um, they're not, we're not trying to remove those because we've all agreed that how important that is for a segment of our student population that isn't served in other ways. So again, that's been part of the conversation. Um, in this area, we're looking at more clubs, not all of them, again. Um, in this area in sports, we're looking at seventh grade sports keeping eighth grade and getting rid of seventh grade. We're looking at first team sports at the high school, eliminating first teams and keeping varsity and JV. Then you see the athletics department support staff. Uh, we pay $25,000 a year right now for a contracted athletic trainer. Uh, we have Joe Davis who's on salary, he's an employee. And then we have uh, main medical partners send us a contracted athletic trainer so that we can have some if we have two different um, sporting activities going on at the same time um, and we're worried about coverage and student safety. So um, the proposal is to reduce that contract um, and still have some time with that person but not as much time as we do now. And the admin assistant is the um, secretary in that office who is currently a 0.4 position, and they're recommending uh, cutting her hours in half as well. So she'd only be in for about eight hours, seven hours a week. Um, then we come into some of the summer programming. Um, Kinder Camp is a program which I'm not sure how many people are familiar with it, but it's the program that we do in the summer for incoming K-Kids. 
um, and particularly kids who haven't had like a preschool experience or any kind of a, a structured school-like experience before they're ready to start kindergarten. Um, and so we're going to take kinder camp away this summer and focus on some other things uh, because we figure all of our kids are going to be in a peculiar place this summer. And we're going to try and fold some of that kinder camp learning that's like um, used to use the jumpstart program and jumpstart's a great name for it because it's it gives you a, a boost as you're entering kindergarten and gives you some of those skills before you get there. Um, reallocating summer professional development K-12 to COVID-19 response. You remember up at the top, um, I had an ad of professional development monies um, and uh, half of it is here coming from Monique's budget. The other half was folded into um, the uh, discretionary reductions at the high school and really not taking it away altogether, but um, taking it away from the purpose that it's usually used for, which is for summer curriculum work and prepping for the new school year and turning it into um, something that's more responsive to the special needs of our students at this time. Um, and then another position reduction is uh, library support staff, ed techs um, at, uh, this represents middle school and Wentworth school. Each currently has two library ed techs and we are proposing to reduce that to one library ed tech. And then uh, middle school has a full-time librarian and Wentworth school has a librarian that shared K-5. Questions, thoughts, wonders? So the library support staff, um, I, 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 the current staff reassignment, it says, what, what do you mean by that? So um, we're trying to distinguish between um, what, what happens to people if their position's eliminated, right? So if you have a person who's currently a library ed tech, um, that person isn't necessarily going to lose their job because still in our proposal, we have open positions in special education. So that ed tech is part of, um, uh, if, if we were having a reduction in force, that ed tech would be part of the big pool of ed techs. And so what we're saying is that that person isn't necessarily gonna lose their job, but they would be reassigned, reassigned to another ed tech position. Okay. So distinguishing between you're laid off, see you later, um, and we don't have the job that you're doing now, but we're going to reassign you to another job and you still have a job and you still make the same rate of pay and have your same seniority. And so to your point, Kate, that would uh, help us to stay away from a reduction in force because we would just do a transfer of those staff to another ed tech position. Right. And the reason that there's a savings is that you are still eliminating the position and you're simply filling an open special education position that's included in the budget with someone who's already on staff versus going and hiring someone new. Would you mind going through the numbers again, what that would leave you with at, if I understood you correctly, it was at Wentworth and at the middle school, what that would leave you with for total library staff? Sure. Um, so right now, each building has two library ed techs. And uh, Wentworth School shares their librarian. It, um, she's a K-5 librarian. So she spends pretty much half her time at Wentworth and the other half of her time at the three K-2s. Okay. Um, and at middle school, we have a dedicated librarian, um, one full-time person, and, the, and then the two library ed techs. That's the current staffing level. And so, you know, where there's a lot of conversations and we haven't really gotten heavily into impacts here because we're trying to move fairly quickly through this, but obviously the impacts are gonna be really important for the community to hear. Like, what does that mean if you don't have, if you have one ed tech instead of two? And um, it, it may mean a reduction in services at the library. We're not gonna necessarily have time to have them teach a class and also do um, management of circulation, or we may not have them have time to do extra duties because they're, you know, they're ed techs in the building, so they would typically have duties like recess and lunch. Um, they may not be available for that because they need to be shelving books and, and also um, providing instruction for kids. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Other thoughts on that piece? All right, so tier four reductions. Um, this one is a little more loose because our conversations are still ongoing um, with our leadership team about uh, what's going to be the most important positions to retain really is what, what we're talking about. You know, what, what do we need the most and what can we sacrifice? Because here's where you really get into um, some very difficult choices. So my description on this, um, it includes FTEs, it includes the number of positions that we'd be talking about reducing, uh, but it has some choices really in terms of where those reductions might happen. So the first is core classroom teachers. We've been looking at the enrollment projections, we've been looking at the incoming Ks, um, we've been looking at um, how class sizes look across K-12. And so we think there may be an opportunity to make reductions to still preserve effective class sizes, but that's a you know, topic of conversation. Um, then we talk about content area, allied arts teachers. Is it better to keep the core classroom teachers, um, keep the class sizes lower and maybe eliminate um, someone who teaches something that's not a core, uh, core content. Staff supports, instructional coaches. A lot of conversation about, well, is the instructional coach more critical to the organization than a classroom teacher? A um, lot of reasons why instructional coaches add extra value in the buildings. And we heard a lot of passionate um, conversation about that from the leadership team today. Same thing, <coughs> sorry. Same thing for student supports, academic support. Is it better to maintain a small class size <clears throat> and reduce academic supports outside the classroom? <clears throat> oh gosh, this is not a good time to lose my voice. I can, uh, I can help you out, Kate, if that's helpful. Jump in, baby. <laughs> I'm gonna grab so, some water. So then, um, you know, again, just the, the other piece uh, for consideration within this entire category is, you know, do we also look at what are the student support positions? Um, you know, we have uh, some academic support teachers at all of our levels that, you know, provide that tier two, if you will, support for students. So it's not bound by IEP. Um, it's part of regular instruction. Again, you know, these four buckets that we're looking at, none of them are, are preferred, right? They're all really critical to our organization, but in order to achieve the amount of savings, you know, that, that's been discussed potentially, those are all things that, um, that we need to be able to take a look at. And so if you, um, you know, look through beyond that, we have some, um, you know, potentials of where those positions might come from and what the potential savings would be. Again, we are still really early in this process and, and it's very difficult to take a look at those four different buckets and figure out how to prioritize that, um, especially when we know that all of them have a great contribution to the success of our students. Thank you. Absolutely. And I, I think that what we can say is that through this process, our leadership team is committed to the reductions in terms of numbers. Um, and we know um, just based on what we have for retirements and probationary teachers and, um, and unfilled positions, what, what that impact would be in terms of, of uh, layoffs and transfers and so forth. But what we don't know yet, and what we really didn't want to push our leadership team to do was to say, I absolutely positively think that I'm, my reduction is going to be X. Um, because there, this has been a very quick process for us, um, as much as it's been intense and, and well thought out, um, people are still thinking this through and trying to figure out what the, the least impactful choice will be. 
So you'll see that this section gets us, I put a little yellow stripe in here that says this tier moves us below level services in expenditures. Because if you go back up to that first page where we had the reduced level services, this number for our gross budget is actually lower than that original bottom level services number. Um, it also brings us down to a two, $2 million and change reduction in the tax request, which is pretty much what we were asked to provide um, going into tomorrow night's conversation. Um, and, and again, we, we tried to use the tiers to sort of chunk things out into types of decisions and, and types of choices that we would be making. Um, obviously, the, there's a lot of um, subjectivity to you know, where you draw the line in, in a tier, but we tried to chunk things together to make them make sense. Um, and then the, the next page shows a summary of the positions and what happens to them. Two new positions added to a uh, total of the existing staff that are currently working laid off and reduced, um, total existing staff that would be subject to a transfer, and then total open positions that were in the budget but are not gonna be in there anymore. <clears throat> and then there's a note there that reminds me to tell you that as I said earlier about unemployment, um, all of the folks that are laid off are gonna be eligible for unemployment. And so we've calculated what we think their benefit would likely to be. And um, you know, the, the conversation is, well, usually when someone leaves employment, they go off and get another job. But um, in this current economy and this current environment, we're not sure how many other school districts are gonna be laying people off and how many other teaching jobs are gonna be available out there. So we're kind of um, guessing that, or at least planning for um, the uh, likelihood that folks are gonna be on unemployment for a longer period of time. And the last block that's on here is um, it's around the capital budget increases. And this takes us way back to a conversation like I don't even know how long ago where we talked about making adjustments to um, long range planning uh, for the potential of the building project. Um, not sure where we're on where we're at on that, but we've got it uh, documented here and also adding to the high school STEM project based on, on an actual estimate that we finally got from Harriman. Those two projects would have no impact on the tax rate because they are scheduled to be bonded according to the uh, town finance office. And I, but I did just stick them at the end here uh, so that we wouldn't lose sight of those things that we had talked about changing. Kate? Can I ask you a question? You most certainly can. So Kate, you're uh, you're frozen too, by the way. If you didn't know that, your video. Is my mouth open? <laughs> no, but carry on. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to make that note. <laughs> it does that. It's like, okay, I'm really tired of zooming. I'm going home now. But I'm still here. Yeah. I'm here in the dark. So um the the document that you had prepared for us in March, the budget investment proposal document. Mm -hmm. What what are these? What's the interplay between these two documents? Uh, so um, I haven't actually put one into the other, um, but this the part of the decisions in this process were to get rid of some of the new proposals and part of the decisions were to try to retain some of the new proposals um, and so once we get down to this tier four and this two million dollars we still have in the budget and i don't know if i have it right in front of me here um, we still have in the budget proposal the uh, three of four proposed K-2 positions. Um, we still have three building ed techs at K-2. We still have the special education position. So all of those things that were sort of, if you remember, they were in pink on that document. Like these are like super high priority items. Mm -hmm. 
getting to this level of cuts was done to preserve those things. So they're still in the budget proposal. Um, we also maintained, um, as I said earlier, Vex Robotics, Unified Basketball, those were considered new items. And a couple of uh, curriculum updates that were pretty critical on, on Monique's side, math curriculum, world language curriculum, um, and the iReady assessment piece. So I can add a, a layer to this that's, that sort of puts that in, into this document and just say, you know, we still have as new investments these items, if that would be helpful. Well, yeah, if there's a way that, that to sort of um, look at this budget investment proposal document and to determine what's, what's still there, what, mm -hmm. what's removed would be helpful for me. Um, yeah. and, and maybe when I sit down with this document that you just gave us, <laughs> I, I'll be able to do that on my own. But right now I'm sort of, it, you know, it's, it's a lot to digest and, and I'm, I'm not clear about which ones are. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, agree. I agree with you. And I had actually started making some notes about what's, what's gone and what's staying. So I'll continue that process on my end and let me just make myself a note here. Thank you. Investments in and out is basically what we want to know, right? What's what's still preserved? Because, um, you know, that's that's a, a really good point to bring up, actually, Alicia, because sometimes people will say, well, just take, get rid of all your new stuff. Because if you just do level services, then, oh, boom, you just cut out a million dollars. Good for you, right? right. But some of that new stuff we need. is critical, and it's there because it needs to be there. So we're, we're going to look at the whole budget and obviously we're gonna remove things that weren't new proposals in order to be able to maintain those new proposals because they're critical. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank great you. question, Alicia. I had the same same exact comment. Yeah, it's a, it's a good wonder and, and I, I should be able to just sort of parse it out really easily so we can see it. Um, kind of, I'm kind of envisioning like the this budget allows us to, and this budget doesn't allow us to, sort of thing, and just moving things over. Yeah. Um, Kate or Diana or Sandy, whoever it's most perfect for, can you guys, you guys are talking through as you go through the tiers. Um, you mentioned the leadership council discretionary spending. Can you just talk through the process that you went for to get? feedback into the budget reductions and the suggestions? Was that just with the leadership council? Did it go lower? If you can just speak to that, that would be great. So again, because this is all happening in, in very real time, um, you know, and, and there was such a short turnaround, what we did was we really had our building leaders go back and look at those discretionary accounts. And then as they came back with ideas, we also looked to see how we could make sure that um, that those things that they were willing or able to put up was, um, you know, had parity among levels. So, for example, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a principal and I say, okay, I think that we can take five thousand dollars out of, uh, you know, this line for for library books. And again, I'm not saying that that's what's happening, but I'm using this as an example. And, and that was 25% of my library book line. How are we then looking across levels to make sure that it's not just, you know, one school taking a hit in one area, but that we're really looking across all of those. Right, so we did have opportunities for the different phases to collaborate with each other and to discuss, you know, well, what are you doing and here's what I think is happening and what would be fair. Um, and, and Diane's right, we really spent a lot of effort trying to make sure that there was a, um, a K-12 conversation, not to say that every phase is the same, but that every phase should have a chance to provide um, equitable resources for the kids. Um, and I, I think I also kind of heard in that question, like, did, did we reach out to other stakeholders in terms of, of how this was done? Or um, I'm not sure if that was what I was hearing. 
Yeah, exactly. So what other stakeholders have been involved in these decisions at this point? And, and maybe, like you said, Diane, because it's a process, um, they haven't at this stage, or you know, we're seeing it for the first time as well. Um, but curious if you guys have any intentions of getting feedback in any other way. I think the, uh, the lens that we tried to use is the least impact that would have on our students. And as you can tell from tier one to tier four, obviously increasingly becomes more of a challenge with those lens. Um, but that really is what we're trying to do is to get to the point where you could have a straight face with the budget, knowing that this is painful and no one wants to do this work. But this was the team approach and I'm sure as we go down and get input and reflect on this and there'll be changes. Um, and, and perhaps there should be. <clears throat> um, I'll share April, do you guys have any more questions at this point? I don't. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for all of your hard work on and what I know has been some really tough um, conversations. Some tears have been shed for sure. Um, so, April, do you have anything? I don't. I don't right now. I know you guys know. <laughs> I'm trying to look at all this stuff. I'm trying to look at it on the computer and in paper. I'm sure I'll have specific questions for Kate. Um, I also am so grateful that you guys, you know, had all of this and this level of detail and are prepared to present all of this so that we can go into joint finance tomorrow night, um, knowing what these impacts are going to mean and being able to speak to, you know, at, at a not such a high level, um, exactly what this is going to mean for us. So, um, you know, thank you for what you've done and we're just processing this. So that was actually a question that I had, Sarah, was uh, this is what we came up with to work with you folks and, you know, give you sort of, we're trying to find that sweet spot between sharing every last little line item and, you know, giving enough information so people actually grasp what we're talking about. Do you think this is sufficient for a conversation tomorrow? Will this be a useful tool? Um, I think so, and I mean, we have some town councilors on, so they can certainly comment publicly if they, if they disagree. I think what I'm trying to wrap my head around is how we get from this to us having time to, to dissect it further and then give our commentary to joint, the Joint Finance Committee and Town Council in order to provide some sort of a recommendation, because otherwise we're just sharing the same information again. Right. Um, and I don't know that we have the time to do that thoughtfully between uh, tonight and, and tomorrow. So I think, uh, you know, I'm curious to hear all your thoughts. Um, just, you know, one, one thought is that we literally do just do the same thing, except just give them the opportunity to ask more questions, maybe provide some additional information, Kate, um, like we had talked about. Um, but otherwise, just have an open conversation with them about how we go from, you know, this to what's, what's next, because this isn't really um, a recommendation, which is not, which is not what we asked for. This is exactly what we asked for. So I'm not saying that that's a, that was a miss, but it's not really a recommendation. It's just like a you know, informational guide, more or less. And I think what we uh, as, a, as a finance committee a board in a board, we need to figure out how we feel about this. And, and we also need to combine it with what we will hear tomorrow night. And actually one of the questions we've gotten is we'll combine this with what does Tom come up with? What does the town come up with in their reductions? We'll see where we are. And that will also help inform our decision as to how low we need to go. Is that 
kind of all over the place. Those are just some of my thoughts. I don't know if April, Felicia, you guys have other thoughts. Same. I mean, this is, this is hard. So uh, I will plan to have this document available. Obviously it's, it's posted. I'll plan to try to pull together something that um, quickly lines up the backup information to the ad of fund balance and the, and the year and surplus idea. Um, and then try to put together something that shows what investments are in and what investments are out. Those are the takeaways that I've got on my notepad for right now. Is there anything else that would be helpful, do you think? Or, and, and I agree with you, Sarah. It's kind of like a, we don't know what we don't know in, in this conversation yet. Yeah, I mean, those are the actions that I took away. Um, I did have a conversation with Peter um, earlier today. And again, I see that Peter's on so he can comment publicly if he feels like I'm misrepresenting our conversation at all. But um, one of the things that we also discussed and adding to the agenda was, um, I think tonight they actually have a town finance meeting or, or a workshop of some sort. Um, to get an update from Tom at like what actually is the impact to our town. So what what are some unemployment numbers? You know, we've been talking about getting to zero percent, um, but we don't really know what's driving that decision. And so we've asked for more data, and um, I believe they're going to get some of that tonight. Um, and so at the top of our meeting tomorrow, we're going to just get asked Tom to give a recap of that. So that will sort of give us some context, and then from there, you know, we'll basically do this presentation again, and then they'll do something similar, hopefully. Um, and then we just have a discussion with them as far as um, process and where we go from um, what, you know, what is what they end up presenting and improving at first reading based on the information that they have from us. Um, and then how we go from first reading to second reading. The workshop that's that's um, town council workshop is that they're sort of um, data gathering from Zedco and, and some of the stuff that Paul was talking about. Well, that's that's I cool. So, yes. That's cool. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it overlaps with our meeting, so I don't know that we'll be able to attend. Mm. Yeah, that's too bad. It would have been helpful. Cool. Um, any other? So I guess I'll, well, we wrap it up. I'll just make a final note. If anybody has any public comments, they can raise their hand and we can call on them or sort of allow them to speak. Um, or if you want to send an email to public comment at scarboroughschools.org, um, I'll go ahead and read that out loud. Does the, do the attendees have the raise hand option? I don't see it under that. They do actually. They do. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see one. Just, oh, it just took their hand away. Just kidding. <laughs> I think they were just showing us to test it out. Yeah, it works. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay. I see nothing. So I think we can go ahead and leave it there. Sarah, do you guys have any other questions? Yeah. Oh, this is Kelly Johnston. Yeah. Uh, Larry Hotwell does have a public comment question. Oh, okay. Uh, read it. You all set? I don't see it. No, um, it's not a comment. It came through in an email. He oh, used okay. A um, at scarboroughschools.org. I do not see that in my inbox. Uh, the other April or Alicia, do you guys have that? Well, can Kelly read it? Yeah, can, Kelly, can you read it? Or if you forward it to me, yeah. I can read it. Yep. That's fine. I can read it. Cool. It says, here's a question slash comment for the finance committee. Everyone mm -hmm. agrees staff costs are 80% of your budget. Instead of cutting teacher positions, programs, extracurricular activities, why are we not talking about an ask of the STA? The ask would be to leave current paid salaries in place for 2020 and the next budget year. They cannot expect guaranteed raises during a time like this. Larry Hotwell. Uh, 
I don't know that that's something that we can publicly address right now, given that the contract negotiations are still open, but thank you for the comment. Kelly, did you get anything else? I had not, no. Okay, awesome. All right, guys, I think we can go ahead and leave it there. Um, thank you everyone who joined, who listened, and if you have any questions, go ahead and email us at the uh, BOE email address and we'll get back to you. Um, that's it, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. All right, have a good night. You too.